Hey everybody and welcome to the Heroin Chronicles. On the last one I was telling you about a crazy treatment centre that I was in and I did say that it was, it was only one of many. I made several attempts over many years to get clean. I never stopped trying. As hopeless an addict as I was, I'd always hoped that I would eventually, the penny would drop or that this time when I'd come out of treatment I would stay clean. And I tried all the different ways. I went to NA I, several times. I went to support groups. I was in religious situations. I went to Thailand to a monastery over there where you got to take medicine and vomit and purge. I was in all sorts of treatment centers and made several attempts myself to get clean. I would go away to Greece a lot. When I say a lot, I'm talking about like, I've been there five, six times with the purpose of only trying to get clean. In fact, every time I was there, it was to try and get clean. I would go for four to six weeks, I would stay in the youth hostel down instead of Crete, and I would sweat it out and try to get clean. And I've many stories from these adventures, but I want to talk today about uh, just another crazy time. And th this was this wasn't actually in Greece. This was in Lanzarote. This was in Lanzarote in the Canary Islands. And I was in Dublin. This is going back maybe what 2011, 12. I was after being in a relationship with a Danish woman and she lived in Denmark, I lived in Dublin and I would go back and forward to Denmark to meet her and stay the weekend and she would come back here. Over the 18 months we were together, I was over in Copenhagen I think 32 times and in that time she was over here maybe six times five or six times. She was a school teacher and she knew I was a heroin addict. She was very kind to me. She helped me get to Thailand to get clean. But anyway, this isn't about that. We'll go into that some other time. This is about when that relationship finished and I was in a bad place in myself. She cheated on me in the end with a Danish guy and I was heartbroken. I was devastated. So I was in a dark place in myself. Plus I was using and more so than normal. I was lashing the gear into me to numb the pain, this void that I felt uh, when she broke up with me. It was horrific. I realized since I'd been in this relationship, I put all my eggs in the one basket here, everything. I mean, I lived till I went to Denmark. Say I wasn't going there for 10 days. Uh, I'd just come back from there. And I had another 10 days, two weeks till I was going again. And I'd be over here and I'd be just living for that time. I'd be, I wouldn't do much in my head. I'd be sitting around stoned and having a smoke and, and come near the day I was to fly over. Um, you know, I tried to pull things together and you know, slow down on my use and make sure I had enough gear for over there. And it was pretty chaotic because I didn't have any money really. I was getting these cheap tickets. Sometimes she would buy the ticket for me, my girlfriend. And sometimes I would buy it. We'd get a ticket for like 100 euros, 120 euros. So it was doable. It was difficult though for a heroin addict. Um, so she helped me many times with the fair. But anyway, I was left in this really bad state of depression. I was down and miserable. And my good friend Eddie, who was also struggling at the time with the gear, you know, he called me up and he knew I was heartbroken. Um, Eddie suggested that we go to the Canaries. And I didn't have money, I was broke. I've been over and back to uh, Copenhagen and 
the last time I was over there, she finished with me, and oh man, I took a load of Valium, and uh, we had a big argument, and I ended up sleeping on the couch, and I couldn't sleep, so I took some Valium, and the next thing, the Danish police are waking me up. <laughs> yep, they woke me up, and then they out in this little country place I am out in uh, Yudorup, called outside Copenhagen. But anyway, this isn't about that. <laughs> Maybe I should just change the fucking story and tell you that story instead, but let's get to it. So, Eddie, my good pal, he says, come on, let's go to Lanzarote. I said, Eddie, I have no money. And he said, I got you. Good old Ed, you got me a ticket. We had a game plan here. We go over to the sun go through the withdrawals in the nice warm sun we would eat only healthy stuff and we'd juice me and Eddie had both around the same time got a kind of taste for juices and we'd quite often meet up even when we were used to stone we'd go down to the organic market and we'd buy some nice fruit and some of the organic eggs and we'd do Saturday morning breakfasts that's a bit of a tradition me and Eddie had for for many years, we do it on and off, and we still catch the odd one, even up to today. And he's doing well, he's doing very well. Uh, he's been clean several years now, and been a great support, morally, and uh, and uh, always got a good bit of wisdom in him, you know, to help me as his pal, uh, which I really appreciate. Because Eddie was there, after Eddie got clean, through thick and thin, he was always here, always called up. Always in the background, if I was really bad using he'd give me the space, but always there, you know. A lot of time for Eddie, good pal of mine. Anyway, Eddie brought me over to Lanzarote. And this is the story of that fucking 10 minutes into it. Okay. So I didn't have a methadone doctor at the time, so the plan was, we were going to bring a bit of methadone. When we got over there, we were going to dose down and we were going to start drinking all these healthy juices. So I had a little juicer at home. I told Eddie I'd bring it with us. So I go over to Eddie's house with my haversack. And then I brought my juicer, my little orange presser, and the central fugal juicer. That's three different juicers I had in this bag. A couple of jocks and socks, another pair of jeans. I didn't even bring much clothes. I thought I'd get a towel over there and some toiletries. Just bring the essentials, you know. I didn't bring any methadone because Eddie, I don't have a methadone. I didn't have a doctor, so I don't know how. We just got our lines crossed, so we flew over. Of course, we took volume on the plane, the two of us were fucking elders. Woke up in Lanzarote, we get off the plane, and before you know it, I can't even remember, did we get a taxi, a bus? I don't know. We end up in this poxy little apartment with loads of English people around us and uh, this little white little block within a myriad of blocks you know and we we're stuck in there like and we're all right we got in there and we 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 looked around so we just threw the two haber sacks that we had onto the couch and thought let's go to the supermarket it's about nine o'clock now let's go and get some food and that because tomorrow we need to start to feel sick when the withdrawals kick in and we want to have a bit of shopping in that's in case we wanted to hang out in the house so we head down to care for the big supermarket that was there and we took a big trolley and we went around first thing i saw was big watermelon boom oranges apples grapes boom 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 we filled this bitch up we filled up the trolley we got a big chicken we got potatoes, things so we, we could do a Sunday dinner for tomorrow, make sandwiches, have some chicken salad. We bought all the accessories. We blew about 110 quid in the shop. And we brought all, the, and we had to walk back from that shop, let me tell you as well, up a hill like this. It wasn't too bad on the way back with the messages because we'd had a smoke before we left there. Of course, we had a little bit of gear with us and we smoked it all that night. Got a little bit of power, went down, got all the groceries, trawled back up this hill to this little apartment. 
resonance. We're emptying the haversacks and we're emptying out the shop and putting it up on the table there, all the fruit. So much fruit. And as we're emptying out the thing, he's looking and he sees me pulling out this centrifugal mixer out of my haversack and he goes, Jesus. Boom. Smoothie maker as well. And he's like, holy shit. Boom. Orange presser. Boom. And a small plastic bag with my clothes. Bizarre. He says, where's your methadone? I said, I don't have methadone. He says, you're fucking joking. I said, I'm not joking, bro. Why do you not have methadone? I thought you were bringing me the methadone, bro. He says, Paul, I brought my methadone. Are you not going to share it with me? I only bought enough for myself, Paul, and just a minimum to cut down. I was like, oh, bollocks. Sorry, man, I got my wires crossed here. How the fuck did you... I, Eddie, sorry. I, I, I thought because you knew I didn't have a doctor. I, and I thought you had plenty of fight. Yeah, I do at home. I said, okay, man, sorry. I should have made this clear before we came. He said, I only got 100 mils, he said. Or 50 mils, whatever it was. It was a very small amount. He was just going to take a few mils every day. And then we had to half that. And fair play to him, he did. But it wasn't enough. Because the very next day, we'd both take him. What was supposed to be a three day cut down. Since we were splitting it, we both took the one and a half days each. That was the three days worth of methadone and it was gone. So I remember us both waking up very early on Monday or Tuesday. And we were out there for ten days. We'd still got six, seven days to go. We no gear. We hadn't touched any of the food. I didn't even plug in the make mixer or the maker. Uh, and there's this this big pile of fucking food on this counter island thing in the apartment. Bizarre. So me and I go down. To the beach. Now it's sunny but it's not too hot yet. We're still in early spring, I think it was March or something. So the sun is shining but it's uh, a little bit of wind and it's kind of like the two of us are sick. <laughs> so we look miserable even though we're in sunny Lanzarote. It didn't take a lot of prompting. We were in a couple of English pubs sipping on fucking this pissy beer. And we are looking at each other and thinking, oh, let's go into Palma. Palma's the city. The, city's, the city down there, the main city. So, we sat and then you got a bus into Palma. Done. So we arrive in Palma, the city of Lanzarote. Where are we going to get heroin? <coughs> the first thing we did was we left the bus station and we headed to the more dense part of town. And we just walked. We walked and walked. We just saw life happening around us. People going to work, jobs, students, tourists, taxi men. Street sellers, shops, cars, cops, dogs, children, people, and we just kept walking. And then we came to a park. And in the better near the park, there was a couple of what you might call uh, <laughs> disenfranchised youth. <laughs> you know, there was a couple of rough looking guys hanging out there. They looked like they were sleeping rough. And one that was sipping some beer. And me and Eddie clocked at the exact same time we looked at each other and made a beer line for this guy. So, this is the way it is when you're trying to score heroin off strangers in strange countries. 
on your own, you're only missing you're sick, where do you go? First you look for somebody who isn't going to be completely shocked or disgusted that you lost them. So you look for more some vagabond types. This guy just looked like he didn't want to lose we asked him went straight up to him and said, Excuse me, you speak a little English? And he's like, No, you little. And I said, I said, Bro, you know where we can get some smoke? Some smoke? Ah, oh, you, you want the ashish? And I'm he's like, No, 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 no way. Heroin. Heroin. Heroin? 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 Ah, heroin. Heroin. Uh, oh, hmm. you can get something from me? And I said, bro, you can hook us up. We look after you. Okay, come. So we're with this dude now. Let me get a local bus. And it goes into this palm thing and almost up. Palm seems to be on a sort of a ledge like that on the mountain. But up at the top of the mountain, we got a little bus and went all the right way up there. And then we walked for ages into this barrio on this side of this mountain up in Palma there. And we're going through these little whitewashed side streets with this dude following this guy. So um, we come to a place and the guy turns and stops at the corner and says, uh, to give him the money. And we're like, bro, listen, let me go with you. I said, no, you wait here, I come, I take it, I come back. I said, man, listen, look, 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 listen, let's, let's not do that, because that, we, listen, we come too far, let's go with you, we go to get, I'll buy you a bag, I'll, what's this guy got here, I'll, how much are they? And he said, like, they're doing five euro bags, which intrigued me, so me and Eddie straight away said ten, and we get two for you, that's twelve, and then he says, you want cocaine? And I said, crack. Okay, and he says, yeah, don't worry about smoke a rock for us, Dad. And he's like, yeah, yeah, get two rocks. Okay, get him a rock. Yeah. Okay, get us four rocks and get yourself a rock. It's five and, and that. And I was working this out. Once we promised the guy a bag of gear and a rock, a £10 rock and a £5 bag of heroin, he was all gung ho. Brought me with him and we went over and he knocked at this little blue shutter. On, that were on this window, a little blue shutter uh, on this wooden thing. Anyway, somebody called to him from inside in Spanish and, and he seemed to identify, say, oh, it's me, da 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 da. And uh, so this talking's going on between these, talking to some dude there, right? So I'm standing to the side and uh, then he's explaining that I'm with him because I think I'm answered, who's there? And he's, oh, it's just a guy with me, it's a, a foreigner, he's looking for an English guy, looking for. Uh, looking for heroin and rock and he told them what we wanted so like that I'm getting the money ready for your man and he says yes he's getting it so when he came out with the gear and he's given to the guy you know I stepped over then uh, to take the gear so I handed your man the money but instead of a blow what I saw was there was a six foot four very tall quite muscular woman <laughs> or at least I thought of one but she had a beard as well. And these most unusual tits that were like two half tennis balls just stuck on a, on a guy. And that's basically what it was. It was a transvestite, one of the worst operations I've ever seen. The guy almost still had his hairy chest with these two semicircle tits. I'm sure if you'd have looked under his bra, you would have seen the fucking stitch marks like Frankenstein around them. It looked like it, like it was done in the in the same gaff where we were buying the heroin, um, and he had a he was he had a two day beard, but his hair was long and it was in ponytails. He had a wife beater on, and he had a bra under the wife beater. Oh, but even with that little bra that he had on, you could see these things. They were just semicircles stuck to a flat chin. <laughs> Bizarre looking, big strong look. He talked in Spanish to me and broken English. Oh, you want any more rock? Do you want any more rock? And I'm like, no, man, no, no, that's okay. Uh, do you want anything? I'll be up till six o'clock. Okay, thank you. So Eddie's waiting down the road. 
I'm trying to tell him, bro, you want this? Oh, never mind. Anyway, we go with this other dude, and we walk around, we find this, there's like an old school, a little, it's a school, an empty school, and there's some wasteland behind it. And we go in around there, and we find somewhere from the wind, because we're on the mountain now, it's kind of windy. And we're sitting down, we're smoking the rock, the crack there with this homeless dude. And that was really bad quality shit, you know, and we ended up getting the bus back into town. And uh, going back to this miserable fucking thing, with all the fruit on the table. And I don't think I had an apple out of that pile of fruit. And I don't think Eddie did either, because we filled a black bag full of shit. We had two English breakfasts in a little pub over the couple of days. And we might have eaten a kebab and thrown it back over. I don't know. It was just a fucking chaos. I can't remember much more than the disappointment on Ed's face when I pulled out all those different kitchen appliances out of me. And what was I thinking? I didn't even have methadone with me. and We were supposed to be doing a detox. Uh, and then we had this bizarre day where I ended up in this barrio, in this hood up on a mountain with this trans big muscular transvestite serving me uh, heroin and crack cocaine. And then we smoking it in the back of a wasteland of a school on Palmo. I was on holidays, you know. And we're there for the detox, you know. And the fucking money it costs is because you'd have been better off with a 20 bag from Dublin than these 10 little five pound bags of shit. So that did nothing for us. We went back to the place. Man, we were just waiting for the, <laughs> the holiday to finish so we could get the fuck up out of there. Get back to Dublin now. Of course, we're coming in from the airport in Dublin and, um, you know, we take the taxi on a detour up to uh, Town the Street or whatever the gear was at the time, with the Bond or something, and we picked up a few bags and went up to Eddie's Gaff and had a smoke. And, you know, it's terrible for a story about it. Always, there was a whole adventure. I can't remember even half of it. I just know it was a miserable week. <laughs> but, yeah, that was... Uh, just a typical like little getaway, me and Ed style. Oh Jesus, how many times did we repeat that kind of thing? Quite a lot. You know, but we persevered. The things we did to try and get clean. This is Paul Tracy. This is Carl Torkey. This is the Heroin Chronicles. <laughs>